Hey everybody, how's it going? Geology 351 from the field, looking at sedimentary layers today. Dark colored sedimentary layers in this outcrop. Light colored sedimentary layers down low. Look at that beauty. The chumstick formation, the swak formation, and other units discussed at length with our special guest, USGS field geologist, Ralph Hagerud. Thanks for joining us. Let's get started with Ralph. Eocene, and it's possible it's also telling us a story about the more recent activity of the Eniat Fault. Oh. Um, because it, it is this thick gravel deposit tucked in against oh, the Eniat Fault. Oh, I see. Um, that's controversial. You know, there was a oh, I should know the student's name. Western student a couple years ago d uh, did a hand dug trench across some scarps along the Eniat Fault oh. over that area and thought they saw evidence for fairly young motion. Um, I'm not convinced that the, the scarps were built by gravity, hill slope collapse. But, but okay. it's been suggested the Antioch may be recently active. Because everybody else is saying the thing's been dead for 20 million years or more, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, if you fall to the north, it's plugged by the Cloudy Pass Batholith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's plugged by the Chilliwack Batholith, huh. where it crosses the Skagit. All right, well. That makes me feel a little better. Let, let's stick with that for yeah. a while. What the heck? But, you know, lots of things we think we know we don't. <laughs> that's right. No, that's right. Um, so this is a unit that you're, like, I have no idea if this is chumstick formation or swak formation. And uh, um, can you help us get a sense of just how you would approach an outcrop like this. See, this outcrop is red and gray and locally green. Red, gray, and locally green. And um, after a couple of years of, of focused and somewhat disorganized looking at the swak and the chumstick, yeah. um, my impression is that the chumstick is mostly white and beige, and the swak is all different colors, but typically browner, redder. Um, and we should look at the conglomerates here. This is where I get frustrated. In my old age, I can't see. Mm. Um, that, okay, that's an interesting one. It's not that soft. Okay. I thought it might be a serpent knife, but it's, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But there's lots of dark argillite or chert. Yeah. Um, perhaps a basalt. A reddish greenish granite. More argillite. Uh, maybe, maybe a chert, a phyllite. So you're calling this a conglomerate, but we're in a, a well lithified unit. For whether it's chumstick or swak, we're we're more than 30 million years ago easily. Yeah, and anyway, lots of different kinds of rocks in here. Mm -hmm. A lot of them dark and fine grained. Um, not a lot of granite, but some. Here's a nice coarse granite class. Yes, sir. Um, and what else? Um, the Pebbles are mostly pretty well rounded. And I think I'm seeing a. No. These all are. They're not pervasively fractured. Mm -hmm. um, my impression of the swak is that lithologically it's quite diverse, the okay. class in the swak. Interesting, good. And, and that um, if you were to classify the sandstone metrology, it's quite lithic. That is, there are a lot of rock fragments, things that, that in, in a river break down fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. And so you look at these things, say, look at all those volcanic pieces, all those phyllite pieces, all that stuff. This is an immature sediment. So compositionally quite immature, short transport distances. Okay. Um, texturally fairly mature, well-rounded. And the, the chumstick is typically the reverse of that. 
Okay. It's quartz and feldspar and mica. Looks compositionally quite mature, nice stable grains. Yes. But everything's angular. And suggests short transport distances from the texture. And it's because it's eroding a granitic terrain. And, and we're, uh, much of the chum stick looks like it's basically slightly reworked grooves. Now the chum stick also has conglomerates in it that have lots and lots of nice, well-rounded um, intermediate and felsic volcanic clasts. Okay. Um, which we don't see these predominantly felsic volcanic class conglomerates here. So I look at this outcrop and it's, it's red and brown and green. It's got lots of, of lithic debris in it. The debris is texturally fairly mature. The grains are well-rounded. Mm -hmm. And to me, that fits the rules for, for SWAC. For SWAC. The other thing is that it's the chum stick, for the most part, has a very simple structure. I mean, it, it, things dip the same way for long distances. Um, it's very sandy and apparently a fairly stiff beam that only folds in big, broad folds, thick package. Whereas the SWAC has a lot more structural variability in it. <laughs> Thinner beds that slip past each other better, more shale in the section. And, and this is in a structurally complicated zone. And for that reason, I put the contact between the two more that way. Over here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real challenge when you've got what looks like six or seven or eight kilometers of sandstone that you can't tell the top from the bottom from the middle by looking at it. Good God. How do you do structure? <laughs> Seriously. Um, basically, it's where's the Leavenworth Fault. Okay. And, and what does Lemworth Fault look like? How thick is the Chumstick Formation? How thick is the basin? And these things are all of interest um, if you want to look for the next cannon mine, a gold mine, mm. which I don't think anyone really cares much about right now. Mm -hmm. They're of interest if you want to um, figure out if there's more coal in the Roslyn someplace over in this part of the world, mm -hmm. which I doubt anyone cares about. Mm -hmm. They're of interest if you're exploring for natural gas underneath the basalt out to the east, yes. which people have cared about recently. And they're of interest if you're concerned about the, um, the dynamics of faults underneath the Yakima Folds that are a concern for the seismic safety of the Mid-Columbia Dams and of the infrastructure, or whatever you call it, at Hanford. And so the, the motivation for my being here, uh, mine is intellectual curiosity. Yes. My agencies is um, understanding the architecture of the crust at seismogenic depths underneath the Yakima Folds. Well, that, that is a uh, tantalizing thing, just the concept of, of mapping at the edge of the flood basalts and then let's project underneath, man. It's, what? it's, it's what we can do. Yeah, right, <laughs> totally. And, uh, people have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to do gravity, uh, seismic reflection, uh, magnetics through the basalt to find out what's underneath and found it an unsatisfying exercise. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice way to say it. So the timing of you relocating from Seattle to Wenatchee is kind of the timing of you starting to work on these units in, in this area? Yeah, so if I'm moving to Wenatchee, I can have a backyard project. Yes, well this is it. Yeah. What a backyard it is. Yes. And it hasn't all been worked out. I mean, it's pretty fundamental questions that remain yeah. about these units. Yeah. Now up there, you can see the impression of a of a stick, a big stick. It's it's. Oh yeah. Wow. I got to go up and see that. I, I can't I can't have a, somebody watching this video and then go. You didn't go up there to take a look at it, man. I'm a fossil guy. Damn, we're alpha pretty spry. Uh, I wish. <laughs> Holy shit. So there's more down I... here. Yeah. Maybe another vote for Swak versus Chumstick is quite quite a bit of well, plant stuff in the Swak. There's a fair bit in the Chumstick also, oh, but there here, is. here this is an impression of a piece of wood. I believe. What else would it be? Well, we could argue bark or some uh -huh. banana leaf or... Um, Got to be a fossil, right? Yeah, plant it's a fossil, fossil, plant fossil. Yeah. And if I knew my plants better, we could maybe look at it and say, oh, it's therefore this old. But mm -hmm. especially 
log imprints tend to be fairly undiagnostic. Oh, and here's one right here. Also. Oh, yeah, good. Let me let me circle around. So we've got decent dates on the Swak now, 59 to 49 million years ago or so. That's mostly Mike yeah. Eddy's high precision stuff yeah. lately. Yeah, and the chum stick comes in at um, 48 to 42. That's including the, the, the Roslinish stuff at the top. Including the Roslinish, okay. Uh, well, well, the youngest stuff. Does it get that young? I'm, I'm just learning right now. I don't know yeah. about these new estates, but... Um, uh, yeah, so with the Swak, we're, we're right, in the, right in the window of the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum, and mm -hmm. pretty swampy yeah. stuff. The other thing that I find interesting is the Swak, then, is by, by the ages, which are not that conclusive, so we don't have enough data, Okay. The swak is the same age as the chuckanut. Oh, good. Yes. Now that's. Um, you know, it spans the sort of the same thing. The chuckanut, we don't know how old it is that well, um, but it's you know 50 to 60 or something like that. These are the sandstones over by Bellingham. Yeah. And you you were in school there long ago. I. And you've you've recently, you gave a talk a couple of years ago talk, on the chuckanut. And I've got a map of chuckanut mountain that's. Um, wandering its way towards publication. <laughs> <laughs> meandering its way. All right. Appropriate for those fluvial uh -huh. sandstones. Yeah. They meandered too. But, um, but same stuff as the swak. Chuckanut, swak, same well, base. Same age, but the chuckanut around Bellingham is quite distinctive. I mean, I've, I've worked in it for several years, yeah. and it's, it's divided into two members, okay. and, and they're both sand rich. And if all you see is the Kestrel going by over there. Just took when okay. your back was turned. Bird <laughs> watching on camera. with Ralph Hager. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, 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 the base of the chuck, the lower part of the chuck, the Bellingham Bay member, mm -hmm. um, the conglomerates have everything in them. But the conglomerates are rare. I mean, they, they're not, no distinctive lithology. Okay. Um, right at the base, you see lots and lots of pebbles of vein quartz out of the Darrington Philite, which the, the Bellingham Bay member sits on. Huh. And then you go up into the section one or four kilometers, depending on who you talk to. Sure. Um, and you hit the, the Padden member, where again, conglomerates are scarce, but when you find them, they're rich in chert pebbles. And once you learn that distinction, you can begin to map, separate the two. And, and that distinction holds throughout the western part of the Chuckanut. And I've seen nothing like that in the Swak, and no one's reported anything like that in the Swak. Hmm. And that intrigues me. Um, so locally derived cobbles, so local in fact that you've got churdy stuff going into the chuckanut and not the same churdy stuff coming into this stuff? Yeah, and that's not too surprising. I mean, this, the, the compositional immaturity of this conglomerate and the sandstones associated with it is at short transport distances, um, which would suggest that we're seeing you know, local sources. And it could be the same, same basin. Do we know the, the topographic highs at that time where this stuff's coming from? Um, you say local, but like... We've got paleocurrents on the chuckanut that Sam Johnson has described okay. that tell us where the clasts are coming from. And I don't remember his story well enough to repeat it here. Sure. Um, but we had that. Here in the SWAC, we also have some paleocurrent work done by Sam's students when he was teaching at Pullman. Um, but given our lack of understanding of the structure in the swak and the clear indication it's quite strongly folded in places, I'm not sure that we can restore the pedo currents to back to where they were. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, but that's in the chuckanut where the structure has been worked out a little better than here. Yeah. And, and the rocks do look different. I'm surprised to hear that since, you know, you're conveniently kind of restoring the Straight Creek Fault and getting this basin all back together, and I would assume there'd be these nice matches. Well, yeah, the thing that convinced me was is, is also a, a, was the day I wandered across a, an ironstone, a, a, a fossilized laterite okay. at the base of the Chuckanut. 
uh -huh. where it's sitting on ultramafic rock um, uh, down along Chuckanut Drive. And, oh wow, this is like this, the iron stones at the base of the, of the swak. But what it means is both units are sitting on uh, ultramafic rocks locally. And any place you get a sandstone sitting on ultramafic rock, you're likely to find the fossilized laterite that's an iron stone. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure that it proves they're correlative, but it sure is. Yeah, yeah this fits. <laughs> <laughs> um, Just outcrop differences north well, and south of Blewett Pass. Yeah, working across Blewett Pass, on the north side, there's good outcrop, or better outcrop. Yes. It's still in places pretty awful. Um, on the south side, the outcrop is much worse. And, and I think it's because in both cases, we're seeing erosion as the Columbia River cuts down throughout the late Cenozoic. And the trip down Tronson Creek, Pishas, Ingalls Creek, Pishaston Creek, the Wenatchee to the Columbia is much shorter than the trip down Swat Creek and into the upper Yakima and through the Yakima Canyon and then the lower Yakima and out to Richland. And as a result, the gradients are much higher on the Wenatchee side and the hillsides are steeper and there's better outcrop. Oh, that's so cool. I think that's what's going on. Right. Um, and you're visualizing that cutting of the Columbia in the post Yakima folds. Post Yakima folds. Well, no, post Columbia River Basalt. Excuse me, yes. Because yeah, Yakima folds are still going on Correct. as best we know. Correct. Um, yeah, in, in the last. 10, 15 million years. Now, actually, there's another story that's completely unrelated. Oh, let's do it. Um, Steve Rydell was once gracious enough to spend a couple days with me, showing me basalt, helping me learn to think about it a little better, and he failed. I, I'm not a good student. <laughs> but he, he was, I, it was a delightful couple of days, yeah. and I, it, was, it was a pleasure. And we had a, a significant argument about whether that country over there is the Columbia Plateau or the Columbia Basin. Yeah, it is confusing. And, 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 and in reflection, upon reflection, the difference is that I know that stuff from Wenatchee. I live in Wenatchee now. I'm married to a Wenatchee native. I've been an irregu infrequent irregular visitor for 40 plus years. And I'm used to looking up at the facility. You're a plateau guy. And Steve lives in the Tri-Cities <laughs> yeah. and it's that flat stuff across the river right. that I'm in the middle of. It's a basin. <laughs> Well, something tells me there wasn't a resolution to that argument. No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but it's worth thinking about. Yes. And, and, and the Columbia amazes me because it's a big river that for, I don't know, 80% of its length is, in, is, is well incised in a canyon. Mm -hmm. And I, at times, thought about trying to figure out how to automate the measuring of canyonness and mm -hmm. go co compare the Columbia with the Colorado or the Amazon and mm -hmm. the Mississippi or the Missouri or the Nile or whatever. But my impression is maybe that Columbia is on the more canyony than most side of things. Interesting. And, you know, why is that? Uh, let's shift just to the right, or where, where you are, directly above the the pussy willows or whatever those blossoms are. Okay. Is um, Birch Mountain above Wenatchee? Birch, straight ahead, yeah. above Wenatchee. So Wenatchee's tucked down in there. Yeah, off the yeah. So you're looking north. Uh, this is um, Twin Peaks. Uh, You're on the skyline now? Yeah, behind the uh, the pine tree. Yep. But that's Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks. Which sits just west of Wenatchee. And I'm, I think Randy must have told you stories about it. Mm-hmm. Um, well, he had a lot of stories. We're looking here. down into the valley of Mission Creek. Okay. Running across this way. And basically, this big white look cliff, you, look can, at that. you can see the lines cutting across it this way. Yeah. The beds are dipping away from us. Beds are dipping away oh, from oh, it, th this way. And down there in, you know, just beyond that cliff, there's a, a syncline axis. And the next white outcrops over there, the beds are facing, facing us so this way. And as we look over to the west, we can see slabs, well, underneath Birch Mountain. Yeah. And in front of Twin Peaks. Okay. They're all facing us. And so we're looking at a homocline from, you know, about a quarter mile, half mile beyond us to Wenatchee. Everything is dipping Everything west. Everything dipping this way. And, dipping. Uh, you know, there are several kilometers of sandstone there, or many kilometers of sandstone. <laughs> but um, funny. So this is the tip top quadrangle, and oh. you see most of my data are in the, sw the, this here is, this line is roughly the Swak chumstick contact. Okay. And most of my data are in the Swak because there are more logging roads, and um, I think it makes a little bit better outcrop. It's, it, 
a slightly harder rock in places. It doesn't weather the piles of sand. Really. Sure. Can you give us a few landmarks? Just to Well, this is Camas land, this flat okay. in here. Mm -hmm. We are at this sharp corner in the road where we go around this point. So we're parked right there. Okay. Um, over here at the southwest corner is a piece of 97. Bluett Pass, or Swak Pass, New Bluett Pass, um, is right here. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mission Creek drains out to Kashmir over in there some ways. Got it. Um, Thank you. And uh, we were just looking at these big white cliffs in here um, from our outcrop looking here. They dip in this direction. You get past the cliffs and everything out in here, and for that matter, everything over in here dips in this direction. There's a fold axis that runs through about here, a syncline axis. Separates east dipping from west dipping. Just private land in here. Let me get one quick shot of the big outcrop again. I'll be right back. Okay. So we're looking at this impressive outcrop of chumstick formation. And Ralph even pointed out uh, something that may be visible. I think this was visible when I was here with Randy Lewis last summer. And you see a rather impressive mafic dike, a squirt of basalt-like or gabbro-like uh, lava coming up through may or may not be the Tianaway dike story, according to Ralph. May or may not. Uh, Hopefully a little bit sooner than that. Okay. And this is the working map. And this is not very scenic. This is a, a print of from my GIS that I'm piling oh, on. Oh, gosh. Of uh, the same area. Look at this. Without landlines, but I'm drawing lines around the valley bottom alluvium and lines around the landslides. And um, here's the syncline axis I was talking about coming through here. The big white outcrop again. The big white outcrop is these cliffs right in here. It's, it's actually right on the fold. It. it is this right here. And we are standing uh, right there. Nice. So you didn't take all these strike and dips, okay. or you did? The red strikes and dips are from um, Eric Cheney and Nick Heyman, who published their field sheets uh, in 2009 in GSA Bulletin, okay. and I digitized those. The black are, and you have to zoom in, yep. things that I've calculated from the green lines, which are digitized traces of bedding on the hillside. So and you so did that with the computer. With the, with the computer where I've basically solved, not the three-point problem, but the many, many, many point problem. I've taken, <laughs> say, these lines are all in the same bedding plane. What's these points I digitize? What's the best fit plane for them? What's right. its attitude? Amazing. And I can make blunders in identifying what the bedding trace is. That rib, is it really bedding? Or is that, you know, a, a skid mark from hauling a log up the hill? Right. Or is it where the deer made a track? Yeah. I can make that kind of blunder. But in general, the, the measurement I get, if I have identified the bedding, is going to be more accurate than what I get on the outcrop with the compass. Because, because I of see the, more of the bedding extent. Less problem with measuring a cross bed, with measuring the side of a, scour, a channel scour. Uh, less problem with slumping. In part because of the, the competence or the nature of the chump stick itself? Is uh, no, because I can, I can evaluate slumping from the topography. I can say, oh, that's a landslide and rule it out, where I can't do that on the ground sometimes. Right, right. And and I'm looking at a much uh, grander scale, and so cross bedding isn't a problem. Oh, interesting. Um, and, and as someone who's measured a lot of bedding, I feel much better about these measurements than I do my outcrop measurements. Oh, wow. Except for the problem of misidentifying what the bedding trace on the hillside is. This is... This beautiful declivity is the Eniat Fault. Declivity? Steepness. Got it. Um, oh, it, it we go from low up to high. And so it, it's a classic fault line scarp where the rocks on one side of the fault are weaker than the rocks on this side. So erosion gives us a scarp that's not made by the fault moving. It's made, it, it's made, it's, it's not an offset in the ground surface by faulting. It, it's a place where the ground has eroded to follow the difference in rock type made by faulting. Got it. And, and that's any at fault's beautiful fault, uh, fault line scarp. Um, the Leavenworth fault. Come on, Gizmo. Um, is believed to trace in through something um, skipping past Tumwater Canyon and then cutting back in here and then coming through here. 
I'm sorry, a couple more landmarks. Where, uh, where, uh, here's Leavenworth. Okay. Here's Ice Cliff Canyon, Tumwater Canyon. Thank you. So US 2 comes in sure. like this. Yeah. Down to Wenatchee. This is the Icicle. Thank you. Sleeping Lady, um, Harriet Bullitt's estate is, mm -hmm. is here. <laughs> this is the mountain home area with classic moraines. The, some of the crests are in purple. I'll say. In here. Um, and the Leavenworth Fault steps over from here to here. Is there a simple way to say why that is? That it, it, w Once I start teaching the Leavenworth Fault and we'll see this big jog. <laughs> I, I don't care to answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, it's a simple observation, but oh, very difficult to... It's not clear why that is. Yeah. Um, many, some people have hypothesized that there's a, a fault that offsets the Lamworth Fault here mm -hmm. that runs up Chumstick Creek. That's tempting. Um, but there's no evidence up Chumstick Creek of any offset that I can see. It's also possible, since these sandstones all look the same, I wouldn't see any offset. Well, that's, yeah, would you mind? So why is this Leavenworth Fault mapped here? We've got sandstone on sandstone crime, generally, um, don't we? Yeah, Leavenworth Fault in here is mapped as the, is the boundary between the Swak and the Chumstick. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of indication that it, it's a fault of boundary. Um, not the least of which is this syncline that we just talked about, which is this blue line here is a syncline axis. Yeah. Um, the cliffs we're looking at mm -hmm. are right in here. And oh, we're right at the fault? No, I may have, we're very close to the fault. Okay. I may have this syncline mislocated on this plot, but anyway, there's many kilometers of chump stick west dipping got it. To, the, to the east of here. Yep. And there's a syncline axis, and we've got, you know, I don't know what, half a kilometer or less of chump stick on this side of the syncline. Yeah. And then, boom. No matter whether we call this swak or chump stick, we put the boundary over there another few hundred yards. Um, there's not enough Chump stick on this side Got it. to match what's on the east side of the syncline axis. Good. So it's been faulted off. Or it's got an incredible thickness variation, but the, 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 the lower five kilometers of the, or more of the chump stick are missing on this side of the syncline. And that argues for a fault. I'm going to recap what you just said for everybody and I'll be right back, Ralph. So I'm sure the bright viewers already have figured out what Ralph just said, but I want to make sure because this is a big moment for me personally. So this is an area that Ralph just showed us on the map that is in the vicinity of the Leavenworth Fault. And we're going to learn a lot about that in the next couple of weeks. Um, we don't care what kind of fault it is right now, even though it's a strike slip hint. But the fact that we've got an incredible amount of chumstick sedimentary material, most of it dipping uh, west-ish, yeah. And then we come across the axis of the syncline. This big, beautiful exposure is dipping east-ish. And Ralph just said that we've got... Five, eight kilometers of chumstick that five, way. Five, eight kilometers of, of chumstick that's on this side of the syncline. Where the hell is that five to eight kilometers of chumstick on this side? That's a big outcrop, but here we go. We cross the Forest Service Road. And we're not going to call this chump stick right now. Yeah. So this is this is Swalk. So not only is there a strike and dip problem, but there's a whole missing five kilometers of chump stick that should be here that's not. Yeah. Taking the data on these on this map and dividing it into three chunks and guesstimating a plunge for each one and then projecting it down plunge and getting three pieces, one, two, three. And you can see this line here matches this line here because they're both the trace of this line across the topography. And there's a white space in here that is the trace of, that's where this line crosses, that, so this line crosses the topography. Okay. So I can sort of fit them together and I can see a big fold. The green lines are bedding traces I've digitized and a big syncline comes up and then an anticline here. And it's, are these oblique or are these true cross sections or what, what? these are cross sections cut through the ground about like that so okay they're, they're slightly oblique they're, they're at right angles to the, the what i've assumed the fold axis is okay now that assumption is certainly wrong and so these aren't very good mm -hmm. um, no that helps but, that but helps I'm, I'm trying to understand what this stuff looks like in cross section yes and and this is not the final answer sure um but it's a step forward you, you feel like that hasn't been done really to have a, a nice 
coherent, easy to see cross section through the drumstick. Yeah, and it's not just the cross section. The cross section is a guide then to a structural model that shows how the folds happened, what their history is. Because if we understand the map well enough, we can undo the folds. We can undo the faults. We can take it all back to where it was flat lying within a few degrees, sand and mud when it was deposited. Just like the textbook. Yeah. Steno is my, <laughs> not my hero, but <laughs> my, my, my guru. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Original horizontality. Exactly. <laughs> and, and so with that principle in mind, um, that's a test to see if I understand well enough. And so I'm trying to get an understanding that will allow me to go back to original horizontal. Sure. Um, and in these rocks, that may be a fool's errand. Yeah. But it's fun trying. I mean, that it's become a, a theme of our class, I guess, as we continue to read papers here and there. Just all this havoc as you as you start yeah. docking Solutia, all this absolutely berserk behavior, mm -hmm. including this basin here with these faults yeah. showing up. And, and it raises an interesting question, which is how much of the, the older structure in the Cascades maybe is actually young Solutia accretion structure that's not been recognized as such. Say that again. Um, there has been a lot of work done starting in 19, publishing in 1950, 51, okay. by Peter Mish, uh -huh. um, on the structure in the Cascades in the San Juan Islands, where it's recognized there are big folds and big overthrusts. Um, and the analyses of those, structure, those structures um, almost entirely neglect the effects of the docking of Celestia because it wasn't recognized at the time that work was done. Oh. And so when you go back and reread stories about the mid -ca Northwest Cascades, mid Cretaceous thrusting, yeah. um, ask where in that story is the docking of Silesia? Oh, yeah. Was this a rigid block and nothing happened? It, all that stuff went, happened on top of yeah. it? Yeah. And, and one of the delights of the Bellingham work is it shows that the basement is involved, that the Darrington phyllite there was strongly deformed in these faults that are post docking of Silesia. Mm. And it raises the question of how much of this quote unquote old structure in the Cascades is actually not mid Cretaceous or late Cretaceous but is, is mid tertiary. Yeah. So the the recent work by Aaron Donaghy in the paper that just came out a month ago mm -hmm. or whatever, you've you've taken a look at it I assume since you're talking I've, about the chumpstick. I've looked at it. There I still got more to digest. Sure. You know I'm, I'm what hits you over the head with what she has done that is was sorely needed. Uh, um, or, or moves us forward in understanding the Chumstick Basin. What I really appreciate is the the demonstration that you can make a workable stratigraphy using the tufts and using the new ages that she and Mike Eddy are getting, and tell a story that fits together. Um, that uh, yeah, this 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 basin is coherent, and it's not showing signs of being doubled by thrusting or torn apart by extensional faulting mm -hmm. internally. Mm -hmm. um, that's impressive to me. What would be nice is if the chump stick had, you know, packages that were a few hundred meters or a kilometer thick. You know, this one's red, this one's green, this one's blue, and I can <laughs> look at them and say, which one I'm in, and say, if, and, and say oh, there's a fault here because they're offset. Right. That's how you see faults is the offsets. And despite the fact that we have a Tumwater Mountain member, and a Clark Canyon member and a Dead Horse Canyon member. Yeah. Um, some of them are known to be laterally limited, like the Tumwater Mountain. Okay. And others, like the Dead Horse Mountain and the Clark Canyon, mostly look like each other mm. and, and aren't that easily separated in the field. Mm -hmm. And at least for me so far, maybe mm -hmm. there are things I've not learned to look at yet. That's mm -hmm. certainly a possibility. Um, and so it, it's hard to see if there are faults inside the chump stick that offset things. There are. Matt McClincy mapped tufts. Actually, Matt McClincy, Randy Gressens, John Wetton, and colleagues mapped tufts to the Chumstick. They thought they could follow for much of the basin. Um, there are supposedly 17 or more of them. And. Um, this 40 years ago. That was. Uh, McClincy 80s. was in the 80s, so yeah, yeah. 35 years ago. Anyway, yeah. um, we're in this dark blue unit, TCR, which they mapped as red beds in the Chumstick. And I think are probably in the SWAC. SWAC, okay. So it's a question of putting the Leavenworth Fault on either side of this little yeah. guy. Yeah. But what I'm wondering if you had an extra three minutes, 
why what is this pink stuff why does it look like that on a map why is it so flat and that's where randy lewis was taking me to look at yeah. this meadows well if you look at this stuff it's a coarse grained very competent rock uh when i first saw boulder in the road said, oh mount stuart baffle i didn't look at it very closely the pink stuff the, 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 yeah, on the map on the map yeah if you look at it it's all feldspar and pyroxene or 90 percent feldspar and pyroxene it's a gabbro a nice coarse grained gabbro and there's a quarry in it someplace i think right in here sure that even though it's on private property i am very surprised i don't look up at it and see it littered the face littered with with, with, with pieces of webbing <laughs> From the climbers wrapping off of it. Oh, it's it's got nice clean cracks. It's beautiful competent rock. Huh. Um, and it's probably the same stuff as the Palisades still in New York, or very similar to it. Okay. It's an intrusive, uh, mafic iron and magnesium calcium rich igneous rock that's intruded in along the bedding planes in the sandstone, and solidified. And it's um, known as the camisil. Camisil. Okay. And then it's been folded, and this big U is showing the folding tipped up a little bit here and you can see the fold axis drawn in here diagrammatically and another one in here that, that make it this way so not only is this squirt of camis cell this shape but the chum stick above and below also so everything's been folded together yeah. yeah okay and then this is quite hard rock it's much more difficult to erode than than, than the, the chum stick sandstone is and apparently um it, this is very flat and this is not in here this is high this is low and as the Columbia down cuts, the Wenatchee down cuts, Mission Creek down cuts, Sandy Creek down cuts, um, the headwaters of those streams are cutting down and they reach this, the diabase or gabbro in the mm -hmm. sill and don't cut through it. Don't cut through it. And so this is, if you will, uh, I don't know, armor that's preserving yeah, the, the flat spot in the middle yeah, yeah. <laughs> from being dissected. And that flat spot in the middle that's not been dissected then is the camas land, is the prairie, the, the meadow that that is not very well drained, is moist all summer long, and grows amazing flowers and plants in its protected area, and means so much to Randy Lewis and his family. Well, it's not an accident. That was a special place for thousands and thousands of years, because here's this flat... It, it is a special place. ...football field, it, it, basically, it's, it's in the very, middle of this rugged country. Yeah, a very yeah. different sort of place. And 